everybody. And uh, of course, good morning, good day to all those who are from different parts of the world. And thank you again for joining this uh, Purdue CIB uh, seminar series. And today, again, we have a very distinguished speaker with us today. And it is indeed my pleasure to give a brief introduction about him. That's Professor Hisham al -Khadi. Uh, Professor al -Khadi is the chair and the former executive dean of architecture in the built environment at the University of Salford. Prior to his appointment at Salford, Professor al -Khadi was the head of School of Architecture and Building at the Deakin University in Australia and the chair of the University Academic Board. He was also the head of School of Architecture and Design in Belfast and the director of architecture and the University of, at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK. With background in architecture, engineering, postgraduate degrees in environmental science, Professor El Kadi has led large multidisciplinary faculties of engineers, architects, and environmental scientists in both UK and Australia. His research is in the field of energy efficient buildings and has attracted a number of large funded projects amounting to over 20 million pounds, including funded projects from ERDF, the Energy House 2, ERDF Ignition, UKRI, EU uh, Peace Program, and other funded programs from uh, both Australia and the UK government funds. Uh, Professor Elkati also serves on the CIB board and uh, I've had a privilege of getting, getting to know him for past many years, and it is always a pleasure to listen to him. So let's welcome uh, Professor Hisham al -Kali. Hisham. All right, Mark, thank you very much. Um, and um, as Mark said that um, I had a um, few couple of uh, very large projects of which one of them we will talk about today, which is the Ignition Project. Uh, and the ignition project is that there is the other project which um, I would suggest that you might like to look at is um, another project called Energy House Two, which is um, about thirty nine million pounds project that we built up for energy studies at the University of Salford. We worked a little bit on Carnegie Mellon on um, the first Energy House one. Uh, but this particular one is really for anybody interested in construction. It's a must see nowadays. It's um, the only project of its kind in the world. So anyway, I'm just making a bit of advertising for Energy House too. But, uh, let's go to my presentation today, which about Ignition Project, which is similar project in, in a way. Uh, it's a testing lab. It's a living lab. But instead of having a house uh, tested in the inside nuclear chamber, we have green infrastructure set out outside in the open air that will be able to change and so on. But I'll talk more about that in the project. So can we share a uh, call, please? Yeah. Next. Right. Can we? All right. So next, so we'll have the. So I'm, I'm, I will talk a little bit about smart urbanism first. Um, talk about the recent urban challenge, why we need to do things differently. Um, and I particularly around the decline of infrastructure. Then I will move to what we mean by green infrastructure. What is the GI definition? Uh, I'll talk about my background and what I believe the ecological principles for future cities. And I'll give you a tale of three cities um, from Geelong in Australia to Amsterdam um, to um, Karlsruhe in Germany and Manchester, UK, in which I focus on the ignition project. I'll give you a background about that. What is the living lab within that and the research areas? and what sort of data you can, and all of you will be able to attract that kind of data. And then some concluding remarks. Next. So I always start with, um, with this um, um, quote from uh, uh, Alice in the Wonderland, of course, through the looking glass. Because I believe that um, 
that quote is it, <laughs> almost like what we think of uh, future cities nowadays. We are in, in really in crossroads at the moment and nobody really knows where we are going from here. Similar to Alice when she asked, which way should I go? And the cat said, that it depends where you are going. But Alice didn't know where I'm going, so it doesn't matter which way we go. That sort of confusion about the future of urban settlement and green cities, that's where we are. And the picture down there is a project that you might heard of or you start to hear of. It's the line in Saudi Arabia. I'll come to that at the end of my presentation. Okay, next. When I started to do my PhD long, long time ago in Liverpool, it's uh, exactly 35 years ago, actually, when I finished my PhD, um, I worked on, um, I followed work by, um, at, the, at the time, Konstantin uh, Doxiadis who was um, based in, in America at your end. But my supervisor was a good friend of uh, Konstantin De uh, Doxiades. So we start working on what he called at the time, the science of cities. And uh, he created uh, a group called the Acastics. Many of you might have heard of that uh, in the mid 1960s. They're still active until today. And the um, main uh, um, reason for creating this idea of how can we make science of cities, that Doxiades Constantinos um, thought there are three things which is major to and um, problematic in cities. The first one is the morphology, is the morphogenetic, um, sorry, morphogenetic process, that he believed that forces and laws valid for small units were also can be valid for the big ones in the city. So whatever happened on the smaller scale in cities will have the same impact on what happened um, uh, on the city as a whole. The second uh, premise was that new forces have entered the game and their impact on the city has not been understood. Remember, we are talking here about early 1960. And the third one, that men did not seem to be able to learn about the new problems in cities before they occur. So he wanted to create a science of city that will be able to change these three major issues uh, for the creation and shaping of cities. Next. And if, next, and next, right? Next, all right. So if you think about it, sorry, let's go back, I missed one. Um, if you think about it, these three elements are still valid today, 35 more, about 40 years since Doxiadis talks about them we still have the same problem. We still have uh, uh, forces coming uh, to our cities that we don't understand. We still have, um, uh, we still don't aim to understand or expect problems in cities, not the least of climate change impact. Next. So what happened? What is the major urban challenge we are facing today? For me, there are four main problems. The first one is the reality of climate change. That change all, every game, everything. The second one is the decline of infrastructure. The third, the emergence of ecologies of cities as a major approach to development and urban planning. And the fourth is the economic turmoil, all the ideas about um, uh, life cycles and uh, impact of green economy and link to that our governance at the moment. I will not talk about these four elements. Every one of those, I can fill it with several uh, lectures. Next, I'm going to focus on the decline of infrastructure. 
Next. So why we think about decline of infrastructure? There are several things we are facing in cities now, which is very alarming. We have big project in the United Kingdom here called HS2, High Speed 2, which is a big project. I think it starts with 11 billion and today raised to 55 billion uh, English pounds. And they just stopped it, the government. We always thought that this project is too large, too complicated to carry on. But there are more than that. Cities nowadays, the day they start infrastructure, by the time they fi finish the project, it become re redundant. That's how fast the technology is uh, moving now. So there is a very, very big question about what sort of infrastructure cities could invest in, as well as on the national level. And we believe that green and blue infrastructure should have a priority within that uh, element. You can see that there is other issues with digital urban infrastructure. I don't have to tell you about that, about the metaverse, about what's happening in digitally in cities, about social infrastructure, the change of city in 24 seven, about the economics uh, and reality of, of that. All that is important. But today, again, I can't talk about all that, but I'll focus on roles of green and blue infrastructure. Next. And you all have heard about every single cities, and I've been involved in many, every single uh, national government, they talk about smart cities, smart buildings, smart in, uh, urban uh, settlement and so on. If you look at what we mean, you have to ask every time I try to ask, what do you mean by smart cities? You get different definitions. But generally, there are two definitions. What I called technocentric, which is number one here, the use of ICT, um, all the gadgets, all the monitoring, collecting data everywhere, and building this meta database uh, to make it intelligent, interconnected, and efficient. That's how it started about 10 years ago. But they realized that they got all this data, but that doesn't make any cities any smarter. It just collects data. That, so they moved to the second one, which is very much uh, politically um, directed. They said, no, 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 no. It's, it's not just about the data. It's about people. It's about services. And what I, that I, what I call people-centric. And the people say, sorry about the slides, it's the other way around <laughs> in, in, in the comment next to it. So the second one is the people-centric. And it's about human and social capital. It's about quality of life. It is about participatory governance and so on. For me, I do not believe either in the people-centric or the technocentric uh, definition. Next. And this is my definition, which I call, I call it ecocentric. It is about smart cities should be those who have the ability to vary their states for actions in response to varying situation and past experience. Those that have self-organizing characteristics. Cities that can be designed, cities that can be sense, can sense, then learn, and then adapt. The only way for us to get cities that could be able to do that is to look at the ecological system and understand fully the ecological system and make our cities as ecologically uh, green as possible. Next. So then let's hold a little bit with that and go to what we mean by green infrastructure. 
there have been similar to smart cities, green infrastructure has loads of definition. But this is the, the definition that uh, the European Commission has done, which is, well, I don't want to go through that. It's, uh, it's about network of natural and semi-natural areas and the environmental feature and so on. I don't take that and I don't like that definition. I like another definition next by uh, Grabowski, which is not my definition, um, which said that green infrastructure refers to a system of interconnected ecosystem, ecologically, technologically hybrid and built infrastructure. So it's a combination and network between social, environmental and technological functions. It's about building different urban ecosystem within the system. So it's not only about plants, but it's about how we make our gray infrastructure, green infrastructure as well, how to integrate those systems together. And I buy this um, um, definition and I apply those definition in, the la in a number of large projects in cities, which I'll explain to you in a minute. Next. Going back to my PhD and my conclusion, part of my conclusion of my PhD in 1988, so that's 35 years ago, was these nine principles. And if you take away what I said about definition of smart cities and what I believe a good definition of green infrastructure, and you go through this nine principle that I talked about 35 years ago, I think they pretty good um, portfolio for some of the project. And I work on these principles for a number of cities around the world, a number of projects, different in scales, but I always have these nine principles in mind when I do my projects. Things about a variety of energy resources. Remember, this was 1980s uh, when there was very little talk about climate change or no talk about climate change. Uh, energy was sort of cheap at the time. It went through the problem in 1970s, but it was dropped down in 1980s. Um, there was no mention of recycling of materials on a large scale. Um, the reduction of energy output was not thought about carefully. And the reduction of energy output is very important principles for me because that is not energy conservation. I do not believe in energy conservation. I believe we should optimize the use of energy, increase the use of energy, but use it efficiently. There is a very different line, very thin line here between um, energy conservation and optimizing the use of energy. We should not reduce energy use. We should maximize energy use, but use it in a system that use energy efficiently. That is a major principle that could really change how we look at the world at the moment. There, is, there wasn't the economic, we never had um, idea about green economy at the time. Um, we talked, I talked about steady state, high level of integration because integration, integration, integration is the future for urban systems. Um, lessons from traditional system um, understand diversity in energy system and feedback from human participation, which is mainly engagement, which we talk about it nowadays all the time. Next. So as I mentioned, I mean, I, I've been involved in project in many parts of the world, uh, Newcastle and Belfast and Rome and Geelong and so on. But today, next, I'm going to focus on these three. A project I had in Geelong, Manchester and Karlsruhe in Germany, in which I will tell you how I applied those principles in those cities. Next. 
Geelong has a, uh, a different problem. Geelong was an industrial city that has struggled um, to regenerate itself. It has major flood problems. It's like, if you can see me here, it's like a, a little ball facing north. North in the South Hemisphere is like the South for us, okay? So facing North, so it's beautiful bay, beautiful setting. But because of the, it's a ball like that, you got a lot of floods coming down on the city and it goes straight into the bay. Pollution, problems, but also flood the city center, which is at the bottom of this ball. The second city, Karlsruhe, has a very different problem. And it, it is a completely green city that was designed to, um, uh, to look like Versailles. Uh, so it's the same structure like Versailles. It was built um, as, a, uh, as a green city, but they have major problem. Uh, can we press in the middle picture of Karlsruhe, please? Yeah. Yes. If you look here, you look at the city very far from the Rhine. The Rhine was the industry part, but um, it, it was a big problem of having a green city in the city center and then industrial area on, on the Rhine and there is no link between the city and the Rhine. Let's go back. The third one is Manchester and uh, Manchester has a major problem that is one of the least uh, city in the United Kingdom with green space. So the uh, ground green spaces to per capita is the lowest in the whole of United Kingdom. And so we have this large project which called Ignition, which I'm going to talk about today, well, in the rest of my talk, um, about how to increase investment in green infrastructure in, um, in the city. So three cities, three different problems, but all my intervention in the three cities were uh, something to do with green infrastructure. Next. Oh, sorry. No, no, go back. We're already next. All right. So if we go, no, no, let's go back. Sorry. Let's go back. All right. So let's, oh, let's go back. <laughs> I don't know why it's going back. All right, so if we look at uh, Geelong, I'm sorry, I'm not in charge of uh, control of the, my presentation, so I'm sorry about that. So um, if we look at uh, Geelong, what we did with it, remember it's a ball, which have one big park on one side and botanic garden on the, on the other. So what the project was, is between them was the high street, the city high street. So the first thing we said, um, uh, developed the vision for the city is to take cars out of the um, uh, city center and make it a green spine, a green spine between Johnstone Park and the Botanic Garden. If we go down on, please call, if you go down to that diagram, you'll have a little hand. Yes, all right. So this is one side is the um, a green and the other, and we create a green uh, spine there. We, under the Johnstone Park, we put large tanks, very large water tanks to take the water from when it's flooding, uh, when there is rain rainfalls, heavy rainfalls. And we use these large tanks to irrigate the green spine to the Botanic Garden. This project, I, I wanted to tell you about this because green infrastructure in this project have uh, produced a major investment to the city. This is finished now. The project finished about three years ago and now have produced an income to the city, an investment to the city of about 16 billion Australian dollar, which is very um, so I was invited there. I'm just waiting for them to build my statue in the middle of the city, but uh, I don't think this will happen, right, by Australia. Right, let's go back. 
So that is an interesting uh, one. In Karlsruhe, we would be very different. In Karlsruhe, it is already green, but how to get this green corridor to the Rhine? We believe that green corridor, and as I mentioned before, it's not just the greenery, it's also you can work with technological side. So the, um, we extended, if we go down, please. Uh, let's go to the map first, yes. You can see the Rhine there, and you can see how we looked at the green corridors and try to move one of the corridors with underground um, uh, metro uh, trains all the way to the Rhine and create a new node of, of the city center over there. Let's go back and press on the underneath it, which is the metro mention, yeah. So this project also have, uh, is, has finished. I spent six months over there in Karlsruhe and uh, this project now is finished and we create another node on the other um, uh, part of the Rhine in the port. And hopefully that will create another big investment for the city uh, over the Rhine. Let's go back. And the last one is the uh, Manchester, and I'm, I'm, uh, there, I have another big project over the Ship Canal, which is another green corridor over the Manchester Ship Canal, but I'm not going to talk about that now. I will focus on the ignition project. So if we go on the little square under Manchester, on the third one, let, no, go back. It's the next one. It's the one underneath. Yes, this one. And I wanted to tell you a little bit. So the Ignition Project is a large, um, it's not very large, it's about 9 uh, million euro um, funded by the European community. And the idea is to build up examples of green infrastructure that would be uh, encourage investors in the city to work. Why we needed to do that? Even when I worked in, say, Geelong or Karlsruhe and so on, these cities are faced, I, I realized that there is a big problem with green infrastructure. The big problem is maintenance. And also, we don't have enough data. We don't know how green infrastructure work. We do not know what is the level of hydrology and maintenance and how to make it autonomous in a way. All this knowledge Everybody's doing green walls nowadays, right? And I'm sure in Purdue, there will be quite few buildings would like to build and uh, make um, green walls. We have a lot of green walls and green roofs in uh, London. You know, nowadays, I don't know if you know of this or not, they are major, huge problem with them because they dry up and they become fire risk. And once they are fire risk, insurance company withdraw their insurance. If an insurance company drew, withdraw insurance from a building, this building will be empty. And we have quite a lot of this situation in London now because of climate change, because of the long time period of heat waves and so on. So we need to test all that. And that's what Ignition was all about. So I'll give you a two minutes video just to give you an idea what is the what is the project like so if we go down to the highlighted next to it is two minute 30 next yeah if you press on that i hope you can hear it go play Right, we need to, the sound is low, uh, cool. If we increase the sound. Ah, here, yeah. Okay, on play. Hopefully you'll be able to hear, I don't know. If not, you can uh, see the subtitle. <laughs>
So the most important here, as I said, it's integration of different parts of this new installations. And this is the area which we are researching. So we have all data everywhere. This is the attenuation tank you're looking at, a very important part of the project. Right, can we stop here for a second? Can we hold it, uh, call? Yeah, right. One of the major problem in the UK is that, I don't know if you have the same uh, rule in uh, United States. When we have large uh, projects, it is by law that we have to create attenuation tanks in order to release the water into the system gradually. These large attenuation tanks usually filled up Usually, uh, companies and organizations need to release water from these attenuation tanks, and that means overloading the network. And when we overload the network for United Utilities, in this case here, they have to release it. They can't cope with large amount of, uh, of uh, sewerage. Uh, well, gray water, let's call it, not sewerage. And they have to release it in waterways and rivers. This is, of course, politically terrible. Uh, there are people here in England, um, crazy people who just uh, swim in zero temperature in rivers every morning, and, um, and they don't like that. So there is a DEFRA, which is the environmental ministry in a way, they got upset with utility company for releasing the water into rivers. But the utility companies said, we can't cope anymore with climate change, with the, all the floods, with a lot of rain coming down. It's a huge pressure on the system. We have to release it. So what we proposed here is to, we put system within our attenuation tanks to balance the water level and use it for irrigation of the green infrastructure. So, so far we have not released a single drop of water to the network. So part of the partner is the utility companies and United Utilities. So we said to them, you are charging us because we need to make that link with the economy. So we said, you're charging us for, uh, for the um, uh, discharge of water, but now we are making system that discharge zero number. So a lot of political pressure on the companies to give economic incentives for uh, those systems. But the United Utilities said, hang on, hang on. We have to maintain this network. We have to have some sort of money to maintain it. It's not good enough for to have zero income for the network. But of course, you can see the balance even on the governmental level. There is now a huge debate that we created of that link and that balance between um, green infrastructure and the economic uh, relationship. Let's continue the two minutes. It's almost finished now. Continue call, please. Mm -hmm. No extra cost, whilst also helping to reduce flooding in the urban environments. Most of the solutions are pre made on site, creating the added bonus that on arrival. It's just a matter of putting them in place. These solutions are especially beneficial in towns and cities as they reduce disruption on site. Okay, thank you. So we go back and almost finished now on time, I hope. Um, so let's go back to the presentation, please. So um, there are several things we are uh, um, oops. yeah, you're right, Paul. We go back to the presentation. 
Right. So there are several things we are testing in this um, ignition project. There are four areas of research on them. The first one is energy. So we are testing the impact of different plantation profiles on energy through the building, energy um, transmittance. Because we realize that different system will had different um, uh, different efficiency level. So, and we have all this on a dashboard that you can enter and you can from anywhere, it's 24 seven, you can see the different type and the impact on energy efficiency, whether it is through the walls or through the roof. So we have different uh, plantation, different type of, uh, of plantations. The second one is the whole idea of ecology of the walls and the roof and what would attract uh, biodiversity, how to increase biodiversity with them uh, and so on. The third one is human interaction. So human interaction is very important. How people react to, to those um, installation, green infrastructure. So for example, we have a project now taking students and staff and, and the public through the green infrastructure when we uh, monitor the pupils, uh, how much they look at uh, green and how much they look at gray and see what would attract their attention. There is another project on productivity on how much green infrastructure would affect productivity of offices. So we set people and test what they are doing and then look at green infrastructure and do the test again. It is um, a research with psychologists. So you can see that a lot will come out of, uh, of this uh, sort of living lab. The fourth area is hydrology. So we have monitors uh, everywhere for every single drop of water. So we know different plants using different type of um, water and whether gray or, uh, or pure water and how much they used and uh, how much the soil get wet and what is the impact of the climate in relation to that and so on. So you can go at any, uh, as you can see here from the dashboard, uh, you can choose which type of installation, whether it's trees or walls or green roofs and time of the year and see the profile of, um, of, uh, of data uh, from these particular installments. Okay, next. So in the three uh, cities I mentioned, there have been always this idea of a green uh, spine that we try to apply. But as I said before, this green spine need to be properly designed and properly tested in order to become autonomous, in order to make it work better. And that is where the living lab, the ignition living lab would help to understand how to create a real green infrastructure that, as the definition said, combine the natural environment with the gray infrastructure. We are not, and we should not reject technology of the gray infrastructure uh, um, in order to replace it with some sort of plantation um, uh, installation. It has to be integrated and it has to work together. So uh, next, because I believe that the future will be linear for our cities. I believe that uh, what we learned from pandemic, for example, and the accessibility to nature is so important for our mental health that we need a more linear um, uh, development with the green infrastructure coming into the city and um, very close and we don't have this sort of centric uh, city center anymore. I, think, I don't think we need that. And interestingly, the Saudis were the one who wanted to create the line. I think it's a ridiculous line of 160 kilometer, but 
saying that the idea which is developed by the architects in uh, California, I think that what I can see the future is the different in Saudi Arabia, that there is no green infrastructure to go into the city. And I still believe this line is too long and too wide and it's a um, prestigious project rather than a project that would implement uh, and express the aspiration of humanity uh, for the future cities. Uh, I hope they will take that into account and, uh, and integrate the ecological system within that line because it's a, it's a very big experiment for humanity for future cities. Thank you. Thank you. That was indeed a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much for that. So let me open this for uh, questions. I see Jeff coming online. Jeff, yes, you have yes, Go absolutely. Ahead, no, thank you for, uh, for an excellent presentation. I appreciate that very much. Um, particularly the areas of thinking about the idea that um, to be productive, there do need to be these, these hybrid approaches, right? Green, green infrastructure, green um, technology, but also the the more traditionally understood as technology elements working in there. And, and within that also this idea of, of um, diverse approaches and, and sourcing, right? It, it, it's not necessarily just a single, single solution in any case. Um, and that got me thinking about, you know, your example of the, the water retention, right? Um, different ecosystems, different ecologies, different locations. I know there are places um, here in the US where from a regulatory standpoint, the water is obligated to people downstream. And so it's actually illegal to retain water. So the idea of even putting a vegetated roof in a project or something like that is difficult because it is sort of running afoul of sort of the regulatory issues there. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak to sort of approaches from sort of the academic side or um, you know, within this, this realm of how to perhaps um, expand the this understanding in, in good ways to sort of scale it to these range of applications, right? It, it being these different circumstances. Yeah. Um, well, I'm happy you asked this question because of course, the United States is going through now a very um, challenging uh, policies, which is the whole idea of privatization of uh, water. So California is going through that now. I don't know what is the progress on this, but it's a very um, contentious um, um, uh, proposal because that will affect the whole world after that. The whole idea of having to privatize water. So our attenuation tank, because we got the water from the rain, becomes commodity that we need to sell. Right. Um, so all that is is going to make uh, movement of water very uh, controlled. Let us say that way. So we better create systems in cities that will be able to retain water and use water efficiently. I think that will be a major step forward for cities, but we don't have enough. We have attenuation. You see what we have in uh, the living lab is just a normal tank, really, <laughs> attenuation tank. That's not good enough. So we don't have any technology at the moment of how we put a whole very sophisticated system in. We actually create a tank within a tank in that attenuation tank in order to make best use of that. That sort of innovation need to be everywhere for every single use of water in the city. What I did in Geelong was pure, just tanks, just huge tanks underneath. Am I regretting it now? Possibly, because this should be a more than tanks right? But we're learning. We are learning for the future. But it is very important question you are raising. 
and I don't think I have the answer, but, but, but my answer to it is that we must have a lot of innovation and technology of using, retaining, and discharging water. And some of the policies proposed in California at the moment would force people in that direction. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any other questions? Just please open your mic and, and ask your question if you have any. Well, so while people are thinking about their question, let me put in my question to uh, yeah. uh, Well, uh, you know, the XX, uh, uh principle that you mentioned was very interesting, of course. And, but thinking about, uh, you know, how cities are handling that or how transportation systems go right through the city and, and, and you know, mammoth infrastructure that sort of divides the city and breaks the harmony uh, that the city might previously have between different communities. So how, how do you see moving in the future? Um, you know, so infrastructure is already there, but we are now looking at more maintenance of that infrastructure rather than pulling it down and rebuilding. So how do you see that blending together? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I exactly know what the question is, but I assume you're talking about the blending of the man-made system, ecological system, in order to um, reduce the um, the challenge between different communities. The level. Well, yeah, that, that is correct. And, and yeah. you know, recently we were we were looking at a project that is right here in in the city, <coughs> that is a major infrastructure project that has divided the community, uh, yes. in, into you know different different segments. And now that it is being rehabilitated, there's a consideration of how that can be. Uh, that that problem could be removed and the harmony established between the communities. Yeah. Uh, again, a very interesting question, and um, um, and it poses more questions than than answers in a way. I'll give you an example that while we are proposing everything to become green and greening of infrastructure and so on. We realized that greening infrastructure, and we have several projects in Birmingham, for example, that uplifting neighborhood with green infrastructure would lead to increase in land value and increasing in the land and housing value. The result of that, that the people we are serving for the green infrastructure have to leave and move out and will move in the middle class rather than the working class, which we did the green infrastructure for. So it's increased, <laughs> funny enough, the, while it's ecological and greenery and very ethical sort of projects, it leads to further split between the working class and the middle class. And this is a problem we're facing everywhere. But we are hoping this is the transition stage that once we have greening on a large scale, like this project for Manchester, it will balance and will be more common that it won't necessarily lead to increase of the value of the houses because that will be everywhere. So it will be the sort of project for the future will always include uh, green infrastructure. So, but at the, at the moment, you are correct to say that blending uh, green and gray infrastructure on uplifting that in neighborhood would always lead to differentiation. Sweden have very different system though. I, I mean, because we are very capitalist based, just like, uh, mother country, United States in capitalism. Um, so, but if you go to Sweden, for example, green infrastructure have been made integral part of social housing. Uh, and, uh, and they have great, great examples of that over there. 
uh, it didn't necessarily lead to uh, marginalization of particular communities. On the contrast, um, it, it leads to um, these communities embracing that sort of technology and they operate this green infrastructure over there. Um, and it, uh, there are great, great examples in Stockholm and everywhere, really. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure what a project of infrastructure you refer to, but there is also, we need to rethink this infrastructure project and for whom and when it, be, it will become redundant, right? Because of the advanced in AI, because of the advanced in technology generally, uh, because of the role of metaverse in the future and how we operate cities, all that is coming and is now here. So a lot of green, uh, a lot of infrastructure is done now for political reasons rather than for the benefit of the people. So we need to think governance as well here. Yeah. No, thank you, thank you. I think you, you touch upon very important issues. Uh, but uh, we can pick that debate later on. But let me open yeah. it uh, for lack of time if there are any other questions. Anybody else? Please open your mic and, and ask a question uh, if you have. I can only see you on my screen, so that's why I'm saying you can just open your mic. All right, while we're still waiting, let me put in another question. I have a bunch of questions. Right. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned about ecocentric, uh, you know, the principle that you have proposed uh, in your definition of smart cities. Um, so to, to, to make it more, I, th I think the phrase that you use was that it should, it should, the city should be able to adapt to the changing circumstances and changing environment, if I, if I captured it right. Yeah. Uh, what we are seeing in the, from a construction industry point of view is that uh, the future workforce uh, requirement would be for more modular offsite construction that that would then you know be imported uh, to the side where it will be plug and play and things of that kind. So, in in terms of uh, ecocentric smart cities, you know, if you were to think about a future city, would you consider that modular might be a solution for achieving that? Yeah, I, th I think you are very much aware of. Um... Uh, of that direction and criticism of the construction industry and fragmentation and so on, and which is modular construction seemed to be a good answer to a lot of that. Um, one, one thing I did mention about the Ignition project, uh, because the Ignition project was very interesting. I, it's just very difficult to talk about everything in, in one lecture. One of the things in when we were uh, the procurement of the ignition project one of the things which we put in the in the um, tender that we want everything to be done offsite everything because one of the things we wanted to become an example of how can we intervene in cities without so much disruption so the walls you've seen in the video the whole wall which is about 15 uh, meter high the whole wall is just touching the building. It all came as a unit and we put it there even without foundation. So we took um, about four tons of, uh, of soil and the, the wall uh, load was about four tons, the weight of that. So it balanced it. So we didn't even have to put foundation for the wall. And it's only touching it because that's an example of how to intervene in urban. So I wouldn't call it prefabrication, but it's about off-site uh, construction. So everything, including the sensors, including it's all done off-site. And it came to the campus and we just built it in. And everything is dismantable. So I can change everything. I can change the profile, the plantation and so on to test different profile. I can change the soil. I can even dismantle the whole wall if I want to, right? So the future, as you said, we 
bring that sense because the first bit about the ecocentric smart um, uh, production in cities is sensing. So we build monitors everywhere in order to give us data everywhere. Because if you sense, you learn. And if you can learn, you adapt. So these are the three steps that uh, we try to implement in the living lab and hopefully in cities, all, all sorts of city system in the future. So picking, picking up upon that, and, and I think uh, as we moved along your uh, presentation, you also mentioned about uh, uh, you, you know, using using energy to the best use as necessary, but not yeah. really conserving our energy. And I was thinking the thought that was coming to my mind was that you know today we are also talking about circular economy. We're also talking about sustainability. We're also talking about you know you recycling as best as we possibly can. Yeah. So how does how does that fit into your thoughts about uh, maximizing the use of energy? Yeah. Right, this was a controversial thing all the time because I, I, I was very much against the whole idea of energy conservation. I think energy conservation is the wrong attitude and wrong approach for uh, in cities. So for example, because ecological system, they do not conserve energy. Tell me about a leaf that conserves energy. It doesn't conserve energy. It uses as much energy as possible but it use it as efficiently as useful. So ecosystem, when they use more energy, they evolve and evolve and become be better and bigger, right? No tree say, oh, I don't want the sun today, it's too much, you know, like I can work with the energy I have. So that principle is so important in, in, in natural system. So we should have it, that principle in, uh, in urban system as well. We should not conserve energy, but we should use it efficiently. So instead of having, say, I like live like a, uh, sorry for the, <laughs> like, we don't want the hippie sort of life in which we don't use computer, we don't use energy, we don't use and make it dark and make it uh, go back and live in caves. I'm, I'm exaggerating here, of course, but, but that is not the right approach. The right approach is to go very much technology. So uh, pushing in, um, um, uh, in, uh, in Geelong, for example, by having the tank and use energy in order to push water into the spine in the high street between the two Botanic Garden and Johnston Park, this use a lot of energy. But what is the result of that? The result, we have a beautiful green spine, productive and, uh, and feedback into the system, reducing CO2 and so on. So we didn't shy away from using energy, but we know to use it as efficiently as possible um, in order to create and evolve the system. I hope I answered your Question. No, no, indeed, indeed, yeah. uh, and and of course that also again raises a few more few more questions, uh, right? Yeah. So, uh, in in the example about about the tree that you mentioned, I I completely understand what you're saying, yeah. but that actually that energy conserved by the tree or used by the tree produces something else as a as an yes. output of that energy, a conversion of energy, but you may not find that necessarily in uh, energy that is retained by uh, you know, infrastructure of sorts. So, uh, well, I just mentioned the the example of Geelong, for example. We use energy, but we use it to evolve and make. Right, right, and that's, that's right. really what I was going to comment on as well. Yeah. That your 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 reference to energy is to reuse it, not necessarily man-made energy, but also uh, natural energy sources. Yes, right. yeah, yeah, understood. Any any other questions? Folks, anybody? I, I was hoping that somebody will ask about the line. <laughs> yes. How many people, <laughs> I wonder how many people, just raise your hand, how many people knows of the line or get engaged with it? Okay, so we have one hand, we have- Certainly, certainly I'm, I'm aware, but I have not, have not 
looked in great depth or certainly have any engagement with it. But I, I do think yeah. that then lends it to serious issues, these questions about about morphology and, and arrangement, yeah. whether linearity versus a, a more node-based kind of approach and things like that. And so that, that's maybe a longer, different kind yeah. of discussion, but- um, I think it's that sort of project that we all need to engage with, not, I, I think, I still think it's a ridiculous project, <laughs> right? But it is almost like a playground for humanity somehow mm. that will change a lot of things. Just I didn't agree with the scale or where it is uh, and how ecologically it's integrated. But generally, it, I would suggest that everybody tries to know a little bit more about it because mm -hmm. that's a playground for us all. Yeah. Paid for. Paid for great playground. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, yeah. If nothing else, uh, quite a test bed for, okay. for those ideas right. and that approach. Yeah. So. But I think the, the idea about rain harvesting and, and using it for increasing more green space is just brilliant. So uh, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I can see from just the examples that you were presenting that must have had a, a tremendous effect on how uh, that adds more value to, to the city in, in terms of uh, the living space and how people interact with the city. And as such. There's a question in the... Uh, Okay, Cole is saying that he saw a video a few months ago, uh, but was very far-fetched. Okay, so that's in reference to the war. <laughs> they actually, it's not very far-fetched. They, they already started the project. <laughs> okay. It's under construction. Uh, I had not heard about it, but I should have definitely look into that. So that's yeah. very interesting. Well, we have actually exceeded our time by about 15, yeah. 16 minutes. Uh, any any other questions that we have? Any pressing questions? If not, I, I suggest that we uh, give Professor Elkari a big round of applause. Please now open your mics and you can actually give him a, 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 actually okay, uh, something that he can listen to. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Isham. That was All indeed right. very interesting presentation. And... Uh, uh, Thanks again for taking time. I know you're traveling, so that's even more important. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Bye. Thank you.